thank you all for coming. And uh, I want to also thank uh, our sponsors, the Bank of America, for the continuing uh, support of this uh, seminar series. Um, and it's a great uh, pleasure to introduce um, Brian Enquist, who's going to be uh, talking this, uh, to us today. Uh, as many of you know, Brian uh, comes from the University of Arizona. Uh, Brian did his uh, PhD uh, research at the University of New Mexico. Um, he then uh, did a postdoc um, at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. And after a, a brief stint as a research professor at the University of New Mexico, uh, joined the faculty at the University of Arizona in 2001. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, Brian's uh, work. Uh, in particular, Brian has been one of the driving forces behind uh, the development uh, over the past decade of what's sort of become known as metabolic scaling uh, theory, um, a theory that's been highly influential in ecology and other areas in biology, but also at times uh, controversial in nature. Um, and so we really look forward to hearing uh, Brian's perspective um, on his uh, own research and the discipline uh, of ecology. Brian has received numerous accolades for his uh, work, works. I'm not going to go over them all, but they include the Mercer Award from the Ecological Society of America, and also one of my favorites, um, the, uh, being one of the top 10 scientists uh, named by Popular Science Magazine. Um, so anyway, it's a great pleasure to have Brian here, and he's going to be talking to us today specifically about his work on biological networks and the scaling of plant form function diversity in ecology. So without more ado, Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here. It's an honor to have a chance to share uh, my work with you. Um, so what I would like to do is um, kind of first give kind of like a broad brush uh, problem. Um, and actually, this problem is effectively the holy grail. And I'm not going to be able to answer um, uh, uh, this problem at all today. But I think it helps kind of guide the overall approach. And that's basically just kind of step back and ask, if we wanted to develop a general theory for understanding the response of the biosphere to climate change, or to even understand how what we measure at a local scale even remotely fits into what may be happening at different scales, do we have a theoretical framework that allows us to go from small scale measurements all the way to the biosphere? And of course, I'm not going to be able to fully address this, but what I would like to outline is at least a framework to begin to think about this, but also a framework that appears to be able to provide us at least with some baseline predictions for how one connects pattern and process within the biosphere, and effectively the scale from cell to biosphere. But first, before I get going, what I would like to do, because some of you may not know me, is to just give a kind of broad overview of kind of who I am and the type of research that really gets me excited. Um, I was actually hired as a plant functional ecologist, which is interesting because on a bad day I can say I'm a dysfunctional ecologist, right? Um, but essentially I'm interested in form and function, and I'm interested in the ecological and evolutionary uh, implications of form and function. In particular, I'm interested in how functional and physical constraints of diversity influence plant performance in larger scale ecological and evolutionary patterns. And to uh, effectively address this, my lab uses multiple um, uh, methods, including physiological, trait-based, computational, informatics, phylogenetic field, laboratory, and theoretical approaches. Okay, so we try to take a kind of a broad-brushed approach to tackling some of these problems. And so here's some snapshots of my lab at work at various different scales with various different methods. So a common thread that kind of binds a lot of the work that um, uh, we've been doing is this common thread or a theme to focus on scaling relationships within biology. And so you may be asking yourself what exactly I mean by scaling relationships, and I hope very soon that will become clear. So I think the question that I would like to start with, a very much more applied uh, question, and one I'm going to try to answer, unlike the first more broad question, is start from the viewpoint of one of our field sites. And so this is on the slopes of Volcan uh, Cacao in Guanacaste, Costa Rica. So we have an elevational gradient here where we're um, uh, uh, measuring not only changes in functional and phylogenetic diversity, but we're interested in patterns of forest structure 
and dynamics and how then they change along environmental gradients. And so if I stop at this one site, um, I can ask the question, well, despite these differences in diversity and physiognomy that we see across sites, do plant communities share some sort of underlying structure? That is, is there something more general kind of going on um, at each of these different sites? And can we then describe then the structure by some sort of general pattern? Okay, so for the thesis of the talk today, the answer I would like to argue is actually yes. Their uh, pattern and process are governed by underlying, uh, the, uh, do characterize pattern, and are governed by underlying scaling principles. And basically, the scaling principles reflect um, some basics of plant form and function. And if I were to boil this down even more, these principles reflect how individuals and species fill space, use resources, grow, and compete. Okay. So for today's talk, what I would like to do is effectively three things. I would like to give you uh, an overview of what we're calling metabolic scaling theory. Um, and so this is going to be fairly broad brush, but it'll touch on some very important points, including um, central and secondary assumptions. So provide you an overview of metabolic scaling theory. But in particular, what I'd like to focus on is the metabolic basis of plant scaling exponents and scaling normalizations. So throughout the talk, I'm going to flip back and forth between scaling exponents and scaling normalizations. Okay? And so we're interested in uh, uh, developing a framework to uh, 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 predict values of exponents and normalizations. I'm then going to switch into assessing some of the core assumptions of metabolic scaling theory, mainly having to do with plant branching geometry. But also, I'm going to explore some different botanical vascular networks that may at first appear to violate some of the, the initial assumptions so that we can then go in to see if these are exceptions that actually prove the rule. I'm then going to follow through and then shift gears. By then focusing on an overview of metabolic scaling theory, I'm then going to scale up and then use this as a platform to actually scale up to the level of community and ecosystems to show how we can take some of these same principles to actually come up with a general framework for forest structure, actually woody plant structure and dynamics. In particular, this is an idealized forest model that builds then on the core assumptions of metabolic scaling theory. And again, we have predictions for ecological scaling exponents and scaling normalizations. And then I'm going to conclude, but the main point that I'm going to hammer on throughout the talk is that this is a baseline theoretical framework, okay? a, a, a place that we can start for looking for departures and also add more biological realism to. Okay, so why metabolism? Well, when you boil it down, especially if we're interested in the dynamics of uh, populations, communities, or ecosystems, metabolism is fundamental in controlling the flux of matter and energy, not only through cells and body, but also through populations, communities, and the biosphere. In essence, it's going to be influencing and constraining the pace, form, and diversity of life. Okay. And not only that, it's a common uh, framework by which we can begin to compare okay, different sites, locations, individuals, clades, a uh, very diverse group, groups. So why metabolic scaling theory? Well, in essence, ecology needs quantitative and predictive theory, theory that is able to actually make predictions and is falsifiable, theory that actually can be rejected and somehow modified and uh, essentially rejuvenated in order to, uh, uh, again, develop a much more predictive and quantitative framework. But for one, it appears to be a nice mechanistic framework to mechanistically scale from cells to ecosystems and to link form, function, traits with ecology. And I would like to kind of offer uh, the supposition here that me metabolic scaling theory offers one way to develop such a framework, again, to scale from cells to ecosystems. So underlying this is actually the big question. Well, then what controls the pace of organism and actually cellular metabolism? Well, clearly, lots of things do. Okay? And I'm not going to go into all of the things that could potentially link metabolism. But what I would like to do is I would like to change this question and instead ask, what controls the scaling of organismal metabolism? And the answer to this actually stems to the origin of the development of this work. And that's, this is the basic core assumption of metabolic scaling theory. And the core assumption of metabolic scaling theory is that the scaling of metabolism is ultimately controlled by the geometry of vascular networks within biology. And so the hunch is that across all of life, vascular networks actually share some common principles. And that these common principles are ultimately at root 
the root cause than for the origin of how metabolism scales. And so if we were to boil down then the core assumption of metabolic scaling theory is that the scaling of metabolism is determined by the size and the geometry of hierarchical vascular networks. These ultimately control the scaling of terminal metabolic units. Okay? So I'm mainly going to switch into plant talk here. And so what I mean by controlling the scaling of terminal metabolic units, we can just assume for this talk, leaves. And so we can basically take this question down to what controls the scaling of the total number of leaves on a plant. And so the answer to this, according to this framework, is the geometry of the branching network. So we can basically boil this down. So if we're interested in not only uh, metabolism, but something related to metabolism, such as rates of production, rates of biomass production, we can take the simple equation that rates of biomass production is going to be equal to some normalization constant, multiply then by the size, then of the network raised then to an exponent here, theta. So this is our scaling exponent. And so the idea here is that the scaling exponent is then going to be governed by very simple branching traits. This ultimately rates of production will be directly then proportional within this framework to the total number of leaves. Okay. So we originally proposed this work um, with uh, Jeffrey West and Jim Brown uh, with our original paper in 1997 that appeared uh, within Science. And since that time, um, this has been modified and extended um, to, um, so for the purpose of this talk, I'm hoping then to inform you of, of several of the recent developments that have happened since then. Okay, so this is the first core assumption. I'm going to come back and tell you a second core assumption, but in the meantime, let's go into details here about the origin then of the scaling exponent. So we're going to take this core assumption and we're going to put on, on top of that a series of secondary assumptions. Okay? And so probably one of the more important secondary assumptions is, is effectively evolution by natural selection has shaped the geometry of vascular networks in biology according to effectively two principles. Okay? And so what do I mean by these two principles? These two principles are space filling. In general, biological networks tend to be space filling. That is, they tend to um, um, start from some central trunk branch to fill either a canopy volume, branch to fill your lung, branch to fill your gut, your body, so on. And the idea here is that this is selection to maximize resource exchange surfaces, okay, within the constraint of a hierarchical branching network. So that's the first principle. The second one is the principle of area preserving, okay? And the idea here is that selection has acted within vascular networks to minimize transport costs within these networks. So effectively maximize exchange surfaces, the scaling of, of, of exchange surfaces, but at the same time minimize the scaling of transport costs. Okay, so those were our starting secondary optimization assumptions. And of course, one doesn't have to look far to actually see that many uh, people have actually thought about these ideas before. And um, some of the earlier uh, ideas of uh, 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 general principles shaping the geometry of networks actually comes from the work of Leonardo da Vinci. And so here's a copy taken from his notebook, where basically Leonardo uh, realized that if you wanted to draw very nice trees, you would invoke the principle of area-preserving branching. And what area-preserving branching basically means, if we calculate the cross-sectional area of the, um, of the mother trunk here, and then we calculate the cross-sectional area of the daughter branches, we sum the cross-sectional areas of the daughter, they then equal the cross-sectional area of the mother branch. And so then if we go out to the tips of the trees, if we calculate the cross-sectional area across all tips, according to Leonardo and area-preserving branching, that should then should equal the cross-sectional area of the basal trunk. Okay. So what are some of the predictions then that come from this? Within this framework of taking a hierarchical branching tree and then doing some optimization then on this tree, the framework effectively says that if we measure, say, the flow rate of resources then through the tree, or we measure the total number of terminal branches or the total number of leaves or capillaries on this tree, or if we measure the total flow rate, which is then going to be related to other aspects of metabolism, such as photosynthesis, respiration, or even the growth rate, these will all be proportional to each other within this framework, and ultimately will be proportional to the plant size or the volume then in this network. And the, all of these different aspects of physiology, flux, and the scaling of branches, the total number of leaves, will be directly proportional to the, the size then of the network raised then to this power theta, 
So what then is determining theta? Within this framework, theta is determined by branching traits. In particular, the equation here then that theta is equal then to is equal one then over then the denominator here to a plus b, a and b here are branching traits. All right, so what do I mean here by branching traits? Well, actually there's another branching trait involved here besides a and b, and that branching trait is little n. And so what little n is the frication ratio of this tree, whether or not we're dealing with a tree that is a bifurcating, trifurcating, or so on, so that can be two or three, or whatever the actual value is. Um, values of little a and little b are actually related to these branching ratios. Okay, so if we then take a network that has uh, that branches across different hierarchies, uh, at different levels within the tree. We call these different k branching levels. And so if we measure then the radius or the length of the mother branch, all right, and we also measure the radius or length then of the daughter branch, that ratio then, and if we know the frication ratio, will then give us these values of little a and little b. All right? So this is actually interesting because we can trace then the origin of this exponent to three branching traits. The frication ratio, little n, but also then these ratios of lengths or radii and how they change throughout the network. Okay? So if we take this seriously, what this says, if we measure then these branching traits, that then should give us our scaling exponent theta. But not only that, the scaling of growth, respiration, photosynthesis, flow rate, and many other traits should ultimately be linked to the geometry of the network. So for large numbers of branching generations, okay, um, for an optimal network, that is a network that's area preserving okay, and space filling, both of those principles have effectively set the value of little a and little b. So area preserving then gives us the value of a being one half, volume tilling gives us the value of b being one third. Hence, for an optimal network, according to space filling, area preserving, theta then should be three over four, three fourths or 0.75. Okay. Well, what's actually interesting is that it's not just a prediction for all these other traits, but we can measure other basic aspects of morphology within this network. We can measure the radius of the stem, the length of the stem, the total biomass, and we can begin to relate these basic morphology traits to each other. We can ask, if we, how then does the length of the network change as a function of the radius of the network? Or the length of the network change with its mass, or the radius then of the network change then with its mass. And as you can see, these different values of a, b, and or theta come into play. So we can actually assess then the, multiple, uh, the model multiple ways by measuring different aspects of morphology, form, and function. And then for an optimal network, then these relationships between length and radius, length and mass, and so on should take on characteristic scaling relationships. Okay? So we can go out and we can test and measure these things. So over the years, we've been trying to go through to at least assess this kind of this chain of uh, relationships here. In particular, let's just focus on this one. So this is the scaling of the total number of leaves with the total uh, size of a plant, the total biomass of a plant raised to some then exponent here, theta. So we've done this several different ways. Well, what's nice, because it's often difficult to actually measure the biomass of a whole tree, we can measure the basal stem diameter, and we can relate the mass of the leaves to the total mass of the plant, and the, ba you know, the basal stem diameter with simple algebra. So we can at least plot the stem diameter versus the total amount of biomass. And so this is from, excuse me, I just pulled off my uh, microphone. So these are from global data sets. Um, that we've compiled from, from the literature, um, and we've done this several different ways. And so here I'm showing you interspecific scaling relationships. We've also done this intraspecifically, and the answers don't change. And so here's a relationship between tree size, going from very small stems to big stems, and the total amount of biomass. Here's the global exponent, 1.99. Statistically, it's indistinguishable from two. Here's a completely independent data set with the total leaf biomass and total plant biomass, including roots. The global data set, the best fit is 0.77. Statistically, it's indistinguishable from the predicted value of 3 fourths. Well, geez, this looks nice and wonderful. Um, but clearly, there's also a lot of residual variation in these relationships. But then also, it's unclear whether or not these relationships hold for different plant tax and claims. We've gone through and done the phylogenetic corrections to look to see if there's any signal. And in general, it doesn't really change uh, our overall conclusions. But if you were to actually believe these results, one should actually ask um, in a little bit more detail, well, in terms of the actual underlying mechanisms that are invoked, in terms of the origin of these exponents, 
It has to do ultimately with the geometry of the branching network. So over the past few years, we've actually taken this theory very literally and cut down an enormous number of trees and coaxed a series of very willing undergraduates to spend time and actually measure every single node uh, within a tree and do this in many different environments. And so here we are cutting down a nice balsa tree within the tropics and going through labeling each node and uh, measuring not only flication ratios, but also the lengths and radii branches, doing this uh, ad infinitum. And uh, it also helps if you have a chainsaw, which is very nice. So we go through, we measure flication ratios, branching ratios, in order to see if we can actually predict, based on the geometry of the network, uh, many aspects of the scaling of the allometry within these trees. And to make a very long story short, we can summarize then uh, the sampling that we've done now for several different um, species. In particular, what I'm showing you here um, are several different lines. This is for a pinion pine, all right, so this is a conifer. Uh, this is an oak tree, uh, and here's a maple tree, and we've actually added several more species on top of this now. And I'm showing you three, uh, two frequency distributions. This is the frequency distribution of the branch radii uh, 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 exponent, or, which is related to the radii ratio, and the branch length radio, uh, uh, ratio exponent, which is, again, related to the branch length ratio. And, um, and so what you see actually is uh, actually several very interesting things. One, these distributions, even though these trees differ in functional form, we're comparing angiosperms and conifers, statistically you cannot tell these distributions apart from each other. Um, but also across these uh, different species, uh, they appear to have a pretty good convergence uh, statistically to the expected um, uh, optimal value here of one half and one third. Um, in addition, there's some very interesting uh, variability associated with these curves, and if there's time, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, but these are at least um, consistent with some of our predictions that the underlying geometry of the network should be underlying some of these scaling relationships. So, but what about other networks, okay? And I'm not going to have time to go into a lot of detail on this part because we've started to look at a series of other networks within biology, mainly within plants, plants that actually um, uh, are clearly not volume filling um, and violate a lot of the other assumptions to see if we can test more of the core predictions uh, of this framework. Um, but we've been beginning to ask, uh, can essentially this framework apply to other networks? And so effectively what I've shown you works fairly well uh, for the external and internal branching networks uh, within trees. But what about once we get within the leaves themselves, okay? And so leaves are, are, are beautiful cases of, uh, of networks. Um, so here I have a very nice venation network and an aspen leaf on a sunny day. Um, but very clearly there are aspects of this network though that are very different from the main branching stem. Well, for one, the vascular network within a leaf is not volume filling, okay? If anything, it's closer to two dimensions, but it's clearly not following uh, the degree of volume filling like the main uh, uh, plant stem is. But also a lot of the hydraulics don't satisfy a lot of these assumptions that we had about the, the scaling of the minimization of resistance. If anything, there's a lot of resistance within the leaves, and as the resistance actually changes from the petiole out to terminal tips, is actually very different from what we predict from the main stem. So what's interesting is that what we can do is we can then take our secondary assumptions for leaves and actually make them more leaf-like. That is, okay, well, we can, be, we can assume that this final branch of the network or the leaf is effectively independent with the size of the leaf. And this was effectively the same assumption that we had for the regular plant network, that the, the terminal size of, uh, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the size of the terminal twig um, is effectively independent of the size of the tree or the plant that it's on. But we're gonna assume effectively that the network is self-similar, that is these branching rules effectively apply throughout the network it, itself. We're also gonna assume that instead of minimizing resistance, that perhaps within leaves, the network actually maximizes resistance. Okay, to effectively slow the flow of fluid down um, and uh, so that the transpiration stream effectively stops then near the end. And so we're going to be maximizing the resistance. Uh, and instead of having a 3D uh, network, this network instead approaches two dimensions. And in doing that, that will then change the little values of, of uh, A and B. And I should note that um, other people have noted uh, aspects of this. 
All right, so effectively a network that maximizes then the scaling of resistance. This is going to be related to something known as Murray's Law, uh, originally pointed out in 1922 um, by Murray. This, effect will, uh, this will effectively have the effect of slowing the fluid flow down as it moves from the petiole and the tips. Um, but then also the network approach in two dimensions, that's just the reality of being a leaf in effectively two dimensions. Well, it's effectively not two dimensions, and I'll get to that in just a second. Well, we can go through and then um, uh, make the modifications. And so instead of uh, maximizing resistance, a network then, I'm sorry, instead of minimizing resistance, a network that maximizes the scaling of resistance should change from one half, as we saw within, within the main plant, to a third. And B, instead of being three dimensional, be closer to one half, or two then being in two dimensions. But because a leaf does have a volume to it, um, this should be close, but not quite exactly two dimensions. And so we've been trying to go through and actually go through with leaves and actually measure um, uh, aspects of, of these branching rules within leaves. But we can actually just go to the literature. And so I'm just pulling two values. One here is from a paper published by Tricot in 1998, Journal of Theoretical Biology. Here's another one by Canning, 1990, New Phytologist. Each of these report, now this, take this with a big grain of salt because these are coming from different leaves, measured at different times. But we can at least pull some values from the literature. Uh, Canyon reports then a value of A that would be um, effectively a third, 0.33. And here from Tricot, uh, a value for uh, the vein length ratio of about 0.42. And so if we actually take these values, this actually gives us an expectation for um, the scaling of morphology within leaves, but also the scaling of whole leaf uh, physiology. In fact, this says that theta should no longer be 3 fourths under this condition, but for leaves it should be about 0.92, okay, which is close to 1, but is actually uh, definitely less. So an interesting prediction. And so we started looking into this uh, in the paper we published in 2007 within ecology with my uh, graduate student at the time, uh, Chuck Price, who's now at the University of Western Australia. He's a new faculty member. And so here what Chuck was able to do is pull together just very simple um, allometric relationships between the relationship between uh, leaf mass and leaf surface area. And these are intraspecific um, curves here that I'm plotting. And we're looking at um, eastern deciduous forest, but also Sonoran desert um, uh, species. And so we're running, we have a pretty good diversity sample. And what's actually quite amazing is that there's uh, 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 remarkably little variability in the slopes of these scaling relationships throughout the ontogeny then of these leaves. The fitted exponent on these um, is actually 0.924, the average across all species. Um, and uh, the predicted value, again, 0.92, from not only those measurements, but we, have a, we had another way of estimating that the value to be um, using a maximum <coughs> likelihood method that I can tell you about later if you're interested, uh, that also came up with a value of about 0.92. Well, that's actually very interesting because it then suggests that these other aspects of whole leaf physiology should also be then related to the geometry of the branching network. And so here is some work uh, that currently we have uh, in prep. Um, this is with several people, including um, uh, Ian Wright, um, uh, uh, Van Savage, and uh, Peter Reich, where we realized that there wasn't really any relationship between whole leaf size and whole leaf physiology. And so what we're plotting is the, the size of the entire leaf and the total respiration of the entire leaf. Instead of taking normal physiological measurements on a per-unit area, per-unit mass basis, and we put a Lycor 6400 on a leaf, or instead we're putting uh, entire leaves within the chamber to, in order to get the scaling. And so here, uh, the fitted exponent uh, um, across species um, is 0.93. Again, well within the ballpark of um, what we would expect. Again, consistent, but I wouldn't say a you know, solid proof anyways, that um, the geometry and network uh, within Venus networks are clearly very different, and that will then lead to different scaling relationships at the leaf level. Okay, so then the, I, I started by, by, by emphasizing uh, the first core assumption um, of metabolic scaling theory, and that is um, the scaling of metabolism is, is primarily influenced by the geometry of the network. But the second core assumption of the theory is that the pace of metabolism that is, the relative intensity of metabolism, once you control for the size of the network, is determined by fundamental physiological properties of the terminal metabolic units. Oh, there's that word, terminal metabolic units, that I used again. Well, in, in this talk, these are fundamental physiological and morphological properties of leaves. Okay. 
And so what we did is that we started with the assumption that leaves are not going to be changing with the size of the branching network that they're connected to. Okay? And if we make that assumption, it makes definitely uh, uh, the math easier. But clearly, leaves vary. Leaves vary in shape, leaves vary in form. And I just showed you a bunch of plots showing several orders of magnitude variation in leaf size. So what's interesting is that this core assumption that the pace of metabolism is set by the physiological properties then of leaves, that then turns out to then be the basis for the normalization within plants. Okay? So fundamental properties of leaves then set the, the normalization. Okay? They set then the normalization of growth rate, metabolism, and so on. Okay, so now what we can do is we can start then to maybe relax then not only this assumption, but then go in to see if we can actually derive then the underlying traits. What are those traits ultimately then that underlie that normalization? So effectively what we can do is we can derive the trait basis for the scaling normalization by just doing some basic bookkeeping within the framework of the model. That is, what are the fundamental traits then influencing the flux then out of, out of leaves? And then how then is that ultimately related to the geometry of the network? Well, actually, to make a long story short, this is actually builds on, is completely consistent if you're uh, aware of um, uh, plant growth rate analysis, going back to Porter and several others who, who have uh, actually laid the groundwork for a lot of this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with a relationship between plant production, that is, uh, change in biomass over time, how then that's going to be proportional to the leaves, but then ultimately how that's related to mass and this normalization. To make a long story short, one can go through and figure out the key traits that ultimately have to be responsible then for influencing the flux. And here are the traits. Okay? There's actually several of them. So these are leaf and physiological traits. And here then are traits associated with how much you allocate to leaves. And so all I've done here is I've taken this, this normalization, this B naught, and unpacked it here with the underlying traits then that are going to be effectively driving um, how much carbon an uh, individual leaf is taken in, but then also how then the plant is then allocating. Okay? So in principle, these are all traits that then can vary. So you're probably asking yourself, well, Brian, what are these traits? Well, we can then go through, and effectively, and there's just a fault, small handful. So this is the area of the leaf and the mass of the leaf, the ratio of the two, something known as the specific leaf area. Okay? So you can think of this as another measure of allocation for how much photosynthetic surface area you have within the leaf, how much mass okay, is effectively underlying it. So leaves then that are relatively thick and leatherly tend, leatherly tend to live a long time. Really flimsy leaves tend to live a shorter time. So you can think of this as a specific leaf area as a measure of investment. Here's the carbon assimilation rate, okay? Um, the leaf mass fraction, this is uh, the total fraction of the plant, uh, the total fraction of the biomass of the plant, what fraction of that is actual leaves. This is related to allocation. If you know the tissue carbon fraction and the carbon use efficiency as well, um, if you take this literally and plug this in, what this says is that you can actually predict the growth rate of a plant, okay, if you know this. There is a little sleight of hand here. You need to know actually something about the growing season length and how these translate across growing season lengths. I'm more than happy to talk about that at, at the end, but that's actually another uh, term that comes in that you can actually measure independently and put that in. And so what we tried to do is actually go out and test this. Can we actually predict the normalization of the scaling of growth rate? Can you actually go out and predict growth rate? And so what I'm doing here is I'm summarizing the end result of a, a series of different analyses. I'm, and I'm here, I'm plotting whole plant biomass. This is above ground, below ground, and this is biomass production. This is annual biomass uh, that's produced within a year. I'm showing you data, the best data, data that we could find for both angiosperms and gymnosperms. And um, what I'm showing you here is um, the predicted normalization value and the observed normalization value. So how did then we go through and test this at the global scale? Well, what we did is we compiled all of the trait data that we could find for both gymnosperms and angiosperms that have all these different traits. We compiled a global database and we randomly sampled that a gazillion times and we mass normalized for one gram and we asked for an average gymnosperm trait and for an average angiosperm trait for a one gram plant, how much biomass then is it going to be producing in a year? The prediction for a one gram angiosperm is that it's going to produce 2.43 grams per year. A little different for the gymnosperms, 1.35, but actually statistically, because we resampled this, the confidence intervals overlap. 
And effectively what this does is predicts our normalization at one then gram. And so these lines that you see are not the actual fitted line. These are the predicted lines okay, based on the global mean trade values for both angiosperms and, and, and gymnosperms. So we're actually predicting the growth function um, right here. Okay. Well, can we use, start to use this as kind of a framework for maybe understanding other aspects of maybe the carbon balance of the planet? And if you actually take this seriously, what it says is that if you know the growth rate, okay, the total growth rate, and if you also know these other traits, you can rearrange them to actually predict the trait of interest. In particular, we can rearrange this and actually predict the carbon use efficiency. It, so if we believe the framework. Now, the carbon use efficiency is actually very difficult to measure. And what the carbon use efficiency is, is the net carbon that's assimilated then divided by the gross carbon. Okay. And so obviously this is quite difficult, but it's actually very important if you want to start to get at the overall carbon balance then of the system. But what this says is that if you measure these traits, you can at least begin to have a framework for at least estimating the carbon use efficiency. And so we used a data set from Canal that reported for all individuals all of these different traits. Okay, and those can be looked up. And so our predicted value across um, all of the different species where we had data was a, um, a value of 0.427, plus or minus some small amount. Um, the observed value from the literature, this is coming from diverse sources, where we went through and compiled this at the species level, is about 0.44. Effectively, what this says is that plants are about 44% efficient in terms of the amount of carbon then that comes in that ultimately they hang on to and turn into biomass. Okay. So I see this as very much a back of the envelope uh, approach so far, but at least gives us a more trait-based and scaling approach in order to estimate this. And I will also point out that if you really want to measure carbon use efficiency right, you need to know theta. Okay, which is, again, the scaling exponent that originates in the branching traits within plants. So this actually points to actually a very interesting little paradox that I've been talking to with several people in my meetings. So I've been just telling you that there's all these potentially general patterns across plants. That is, they have share similar branching structures in terms of their underlying geometry. They share similar scaling relationships. And so then the interesting paradox then is how can one account for diversity within the metabolic scale and framework. And it's actually something that I've been struggling with and trying to uh, understand and come, come to terms with. But effectively, what we can start to do is we can advance then the theoretical framework by relaxing some of these secondary optimization assumptions. That is, individuals or species or taxa may vary in the traits then that underlie the scaling and metabolism, and very clearly they do. Um, in addition, individuals can vary in terms of their branching geometries. Okay? Not all plants have volume filling, branch, uh, uh, volume filling branching. Um, not all plants then will have you know, uh, uh, area preserving branching. So there's likely, there's definitely probably a diver uh, aspects of diversity can be um, kind of rolled into this once we start to account for variability um, in either normalizations or scaling exponents. But another way to start thinking about differences in diversity is effectively taking size out of the equation. I mean, literally correcting for the size effects, correcting for differences in metabolism that just come along for the ride as you, as you have differences in terms of, of, of plant size. And so the question is, well, what then is influencing this residual variation? And according to this framework, this residual variation is likely all due to trait level variability uh, between species or individuals here. So these traits are likely the ones then that are varying. So in an effort to get at that, we've been trying to do an experimental approach. And this is actually work um, that's still in, in prep, but I'll at least give you a little bit of a, a teaser here. This is out of Eric Garnier's lab, um, uh, coming from growth rate data on actually um, uh, 25 different species of grasses. Okay? And um, so what we tried to do is grow them all in growth chambers where we actually uh, keep them all at the same size. That is, we start measuring growth rates when they're all at uh, effectively one gram, right? And we actually standardize you know, uh, uh, at, at different sizes. So effectively what we're doing is we're, we're taking a given size and asking what controls residual variability um, in growth rate. And so the prediction is that all of that variability in growth rate, once you standardize for size, has to do with variability in these traits across these different grasses. We've uh, gone through and measured them, these different traits. And Eric Garnier's lab uh, has been fantastic in terms of assisting with this. 
And so here's the expectation. Here's the predicted growth rate if we use more of an instantaneous form of growth rate based on uh, uh, daily and or weekly uh, uh, growth rates. Um, and here's the observed growth rate. And so here's the one-to-one -one line. Statistically, they're indistinguishable from one-to-one, -one, one -to -one, but clearly, even though the R squared is high, we're still not accounting for all the variability. And so effectively, what this is saying is that once you control for size, a lot of residual variation that we see has to do with species that differ in growth rate due to trait differences. Okay? And presumably, this has to do with differences in life history, um, which presumably will change in different environments. Okay? So then to summarize then this first part before then to get into my shorter second part, is that the core assumptions of network geometry and branching ratios um, are hypothesized to underlie these, a lot of these different scaling relationships. And empirical measures of network morphologies appear to be consistent. Okay? And um, we're very much interested in trying to push this to see if there are better ways to begin to assess this both experimentally and also uh, within the field. And again, this is consistent with the hypothesis is that the geometry of the vascular network is underlying botanical form and some function. Now these optimization assumptions that volume filling area preserving can be relaxed Okay, and because of that, we can maybe start to uh, understand other uh, 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 botanical networks, but also understand how we can generate variability in scaling exponents. But also, if we elaborate metabolic scaling theory, we can detail the specific traits then responsible for variation in growth rate. Okay, so if you take the framework of the network model seriously, it effectively tells us which traits ultimately must underlie growth rate. And again, I would like to actually show that this, uh, this approach is actually quite similar um, to other very more classic approaches, if you're familiar with uh, more classic relative growth rate analysis, or either uh, the early models of plant forms, such as the pipe model from Shinazaki. This actually builds um, on that work. Um, and again, we can uh, incorporate additional variability, and we can make adjustments um, uh, depending on the local environment. So then for the last part, what I would like to do is actually um, use this uh, basis as a springboard to begin to talk about ecology and a little bit more about ecosystems. Um, in particular, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, present a model for what we call an idealized forest. Okay? And so the expectation is that this is going to fail, but at least it's a framework for us to begin to understand uh, uh, form function and dynamics okay, within forests. So then the question again here is, how does metabolism influence the structure of plant communities and ecosystems? Can we use this work to then scale up? And so what we're going to do is we're going to start by trying to understand the origin and dynamics of size distributions. So what I mean by size distributions, if we think then about uh, my local plot here in Costa Rica, we're interested in counting all individuals, but also measuring their sizes, okay, how many big things we have, how many small ones, and so on. And so what we can do is we can start with an area, and we can begin to group individuals into different size classes or bins. Okay? And so we're going to have seedlings, saplings, larger trees, and so on. And so we're going to then group and bin them, bin them according to possible differences then in their sizes. Okay? So very simply, if you imagine this as a very simple discrete distribution here, and we can flip this into a continuous version too. We can start with differences in plant size. We can have different K branching levels or K size levels going from the small size to the largest. We can then count the total number of individuals from saplings to adults. Um, and of course, we're going to get some sort of distribution. Okay? I'm not going to um, make any assumptions now about what the form of that distribution is, but we should also realize in the case of plants, this is also a crude pro proxy for time or age. Right? So all seedlings have to start out small and ultimately grow to large sizes. So there's also a dynamical component to this as well. Okay? So when you look at the size distribution, there's also a dynamical component um, with changes in size across time. So let's make some very simplifying, in fact, deliberately simplifying assumptions. Okay? And so you can think of these, again, as secondary assumptions that, again, are going to be able to teach us something about um, uh, potential deviations that we may see. So let's assume that there's no recruitment limitation. That is, seeds are coming in from everywhere. Right? So there's always going to be seedlings growing up. There's no external disturbance. We're going to then assume that the forest is in resource and demographic steady state. And so you can think of this as effectively Mother Nature supplies uh, plants with a given amount of resource per unit time, per unit area. Right? And so what plants are really good at doing is growing in size and utilizing all of those resources until effectively they're all gone. Right? And so if we assume then this resource uh, steady state, 
We can think of this as a zero-sum game under these conditions. That is, if anybody grows in size, okay, somebody has to suffer. So the underlying demography is going to be linked. That is, any sort of change in growth is then going to be influencing mortality. So changes in growth rates will then change mortality. So we're going to envision this as not only a resource steady state, but also a demographic steady state, a zero-sum dynamic. Okay. So all plants then, we're going to assume, just like a, the above ground branching network, all plants are going to fill space to utilize all of the limited <coughs> resources. Okay, so this is actually very similar to the space filling uh, assumption that we see within plants. But then we're going to also assume that the forest is comprised of allometrically ideal individuals. That is, all the individuals then within the forest will be following then these predicted scaling relationships based on an optimal geometry, okay, which may or may not be true. But we're going to make that assumption and see where that lies. And so violations of any of these assumptions will then cause deviations from the predictions that I'm going to tell you about in just a minute. OK, so what is this principle of space filling? So within, the, in a, within a forest con, uh, 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 community, if competition to utilize all resources, OK, so we can think of lights or water, um, the individual ca canopies then will fill all available space okay, across the size distribution. Okay, so the number of leaves of all individuals within any size class equally fills the same amount of area independent of plant size K. Okay. So if I calculate the total leaf area in a given size class, which is the total number of individuals multiplied by the total uh, leaf area of those individuals, that then should equal the total leaf area in the next larger size class and so on. Okay, so we're going to invoke this. And actually, you can go out and you can measure this to see whether or not this is indeed upheld. But this is um, effectively how we translate resource limitation into the principle of space filling. So we're also going to assume that uh, individuals are allometrically ideal. Now, you've seen these before. We're going to assume that growth rate scales as mass to the three-fourths or as radius or stem diameter squared. The canopy, the rooting dimensions are going to be related to A and B or different combinations as either three-eighths, one-fourth, or two-thirds. The radius of the canopy or even the rooting extent will also scale accordingly. Again, this all, these all follow from these, these proposed principles that we published on earlier. Whether or not these are true or not, you can actually go in, and if you actually don't believe that these, you can put in your own values, and you'll get subtly uh, different predictions. So when one goes through and does that, you're able then to derive a series of different predictions. Okay? Under resource and demographic steady state, all mortality and turnover within the forest is due to competitive thinning driven by the growth rate of the individual plants. So the growth rate of the plants are then driving the mortality within this framework. We can then predict several different stand properties, such as uh, the nearest neighbor distance, how close trees are, uh, how the canopies uh, uh, should scale, how they should be spaced. Uh, this principle of energy equivalence, I'm not going to have time to go into. The total forest resource use, or NPP, uh, the mortality rate, but in particular, the distribution of sizes. And so if undisturbed within this framework, all forests or plant communities should approximate then these predictions. So I'm just going to cover three predictions here in the time that I have left. And the first prediction is the scaling and the, no, uh, the, uh, the scaling, not only the, uh, the prediction for the, the scaling exponent, but also the prediction for the scaling normalization of the size distribution. And effectively, under these, uh, these assumptions, the total number of individuals per size class should scale inversely to stem size or stem diameter to follow a minus 2 rule. But the normalization then of this curve is going to be influenced by the rate of limiting resource supply, but also the metabolic intensity per unit tissue. And effectively, if you remember back, this is given then by the traits, the average traits then, that underlie um, this value of B0. One in principle can go out and actually measure that. And so this is the steady state then distribution. The other two predictions worth noting is the spacing of individuals within the forest. And this actually came from some creative thinking one day after surveying one of our plots within Costa Rica and asking, on average, uh, this is over lunch, of course, and maybe uh, 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 in the evening over beer, um, ask, on average, if you're uh, sitting underneath a canopy, how far do you have to travel in order then to encounter a tree of a very similar size? Okay. 
Is that independent then across the forest or does it actually scale? Within the framework of this model, the average distance between individuals in the size class should actually scale isometrically or be directly proportional to the stem radius of the size class. So the average distance should increase linearly with the stem radius okay, of all individuals in the forest. But also the more intriguing prediction is that the scaling and the normalization of mortality rate um, should be in, uh, uh, tightly tied then to the geometry and the scaling of metabolism and growth. So the mortality rate here, and this is from pure com uh, competitively driven mortality, should then scale inversely to the stem radius, so it should then decrease to the minus two-thirds power, but the normalization of this, this capital A bar, is given by the normalization of the stem growth rate, right? So we can actually measure these values and actually put it in to actually have a hard prediction about what exactly the mortality rate then should be. So to very quickly summarize within this framework, uh, this idealized forest framework predicts something like this, where we have um, many different small individuals, fewer numbers of large ones. As the small ones then grow in size to become large ones, they're going to die at a given rate. Um, but then also their canopies are going to be separated and their stems are going to be separated uh, at increasing distances from each other. And so we have at least a framework to predict then how the, that those should scale with each other. So we've cobbled together several different data sets. One in particular I just wanted to point out. Um, this is a, um, a long-term forest dynamics plot that I maintain within Guanacaste, Costa Rica. This is seasonally dry tropical forest. This is a San Emilio plot. It's 16 hectares and all stems have been mapped. Um, so in general there's approximately about 20,000 stems uh, within this forest. So what's nice is that not only can we map then the distances between individuals within the forest, but we can also trace the fates of individuals, calculate mortality, and so on. Um, so what does the size distribution look like? And so here what I'm plotting is a distribution of sizes. This is the uh, stem diameter, number of trees in these different size classes. In the San Emilio forest, separated by two time periods, 1976-1996, reading the most recent data together. Um, here is the, the expectation for a minus two. Uh, relationship. In fact, our maximum likelihood estimate um, for, uh, for this in 1976 is actually a little steep, minus 2.4. 1996, uh, effectively, actually statistically, right on minus 2. We can look at different forests. Here's the Barrow, Colorado Island data set. This is a 50 hectare uh, plot, much larger. Here we're looking at several different years, plotting all those data on top of each other. Uh, to cut to the chase, what we actually see is that the maximum likelihood exponent across years Although these are actually significantly different from minus two, uh, as you can see, they're actually quite close to the expectation. We can still look at the prediction for the average nearest neighbor distance. The prediction is that this should be an isometric relationship, that is, it should have a slope of one. And indeed, across years, we see that uh, the exponent in both years uh, is indistinguishable from one, indicating that indeed larger trees are further apart from each other. But what's actually very interesting and important here is that we actually predict how then that spacing should then scale or change um, then as the uh, individuals mature from small cohorts to large cohorts. Um, perhaps the, the, the most interesting prediction is the actual the prediction for the relationship for basal stem diameter and annualized mortality rate. Um, within this framework, the predicted function, again, is that mortality rate then should scale inversely with stem radius to the minus two-thirds power. But then the value of the normalization is actually given by the normalization of growth rate. So for these trees within this forest, we've calculated an average value. That value for this forest is actually um, 0.2. This is the predicted function for the mortality rate which is actually, um, for again, what I consider a back of the envelope approximation. This is not a bad uh, overall fit, but very clearly we're seeing significant deviations you know, from this relationship, indicating that there's other sources of mortality other than just competitively driven mortality that's then providing our prediction for the scaling of mortality within this forest. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip um, this part over succession and then just jump to a more global perspective, which is actually my last slide. And that is to ask, well, in general, how well do these distributions uh, look across the globe? And so what we've tried to do is compile um, within another uh, a, a data network that we're trying to organize at the University of Arizona, the Salvius Network, where we're compiling um, smaller forest plot data from around the globe. We're able to go in and actually assess the, the size distribution um, within both temperate and uh, tropical forests. 
and have several different flavors of at least fitting this exponent. And our best estimate for what this exponent is does indeed uh, um, uh, uh, overlap uh, quite, quite strongly with the predicted value of minus 2. But yet there is significant variability that we do see across different sites. And I have actually um, quite a few things to say about that, what may be causing that. But this is, appears to be indication anyway, or at least can, is consistent, that most forests appear close to the predictions um, uh, of a forest organized around a resource in a demographic steady state. Okay? And I would not claim that this holds across all forests, but it appears to be at least consistent with that expectation. Okay. So then to conclude, I've covered a lot of different ground here, but what I would like you to take home is that overall metabolic scaling theory um, posits that the scaling of plant metabolism, mainly carbon assimilation, respiration, and so on, is mainly due to two primary things. One is the geometry of these fractal-like branching networks, okay, and that then reflect general principles of design. And the other is this notion that of, of fundamental leaf and physiological traits that underlie effectively um, uh, variability in um, uh, carbon assimilation and respiration. These effectively define and give us our normalization. So we can go from talking about uh, derivation of theory for both scaling exponents and scaling normalizations. These then can be defined to show how quantitatively you can then link aspects of traits, variation in cellular physiology, all the way to populations, communities, and um, uh, presumably here because many aspects of uh, uh, carbon flux will also influence ecosystems, also the ecosystems. And again, the generalities in the scaling of metabolism, plant form, and function then yield then these general ecological scaling relationships okay, that I've shown. And so the theory is able to make quantitative predictions, okay? And because of which it is falsifiable, one can go out and one can actually measure these to see how well uh, it holds up. And so we're able to link many different attributes of, um, of uh, populations and forests, in particular size distribution, spatial packing, and dynamics. And so I'd like to again emphasize that the theory makes quantitative predictions that can be tested and rejected, okay? And because of which, I think this is actually exciting because we can now um, try to develop more of a quantitative and predictive framework for, again, scaling from leaf then to globe. And again, I think this, um, uh, what I'm really excited about is that throughout this work, it highlights this mechanis mechanistic linkage between form and function of individuals, but also of ecology as well. And again, this points to parameters that can be measured, um, and you can actually test this framework. But it's also a basis by which to incorporate much more detail to build um, more models. Now, I'd like to emphasize that this theory does not capture all of the variation. Okay, and I'm sure you were very quick to point out that in some of the plots there were several deviations and uh, indications of curved linearity. But what I'd like to argue is that this provides a zero order framework or point of departure for a more predictive um, understanding of what these deviations actually mean. And these deviations are probably due to other factors, things like variation in branching architecture, different sources of mortality, herbivory, asymmetric competition, species coexistence. We haven't touched on all of that, of course. But again, these are not included in this deliberately simplified theory. Now, what we would like to actually argue in this is that the theory is relevant um, to all of these different aspects because size and metabolism places fundamental constraints on rates of production and the number and sizes of individuals. And so then with that, I would actually like to close with a quote here by the statistician George Box. Um, all models are wrong and some models are useful, okay? And so what I've shown you here is an abstraction of a very detailed and complicated botanical world. Okay? And I'm not claiming that this is going to solve everything or even fit everything. Um, but the goal here that has been driving this work is to develop a quantitative and falsifiable predictions that can describe as much of the variability that we see in the natural world, and especially having to do with scaling, with as few biologically meaningful parameters and assumptions as possible. And so then, in that respect, I would like to then end by saying that I think metabolic scaling is useful. And I would like to then close by thanking a lot of people who uh, not only have learned a tremendous amount about, um, but have been uh, very good collaborators and friends over the years, in particular, uh, Jeffrey Rest, uh, Jim Brown, 
uh, Van Savage, uh, who's now at UCLA, um, Lisa uh, Patrick Bentley, who's a postdoc of ours at University of Arizona, John Sperry, Peter Rice, uh, Chuck Price, uh, Ethan White have contributed a lot to the work uh, that I pre uh, presented you, in addition to people like Carl Nicholas uh, and several other of my students, some of which are, uh, are, are here, and several different funding sources who have supported me. So thank you for your time. I'd be happy to take any questions. So mine is a somewhat technical question. That, uh, it's very interesting when you showed those uh, measured distributions of the branching network. You, mm -hmm. know, you cut down the trees and yeah. actually measure yeah. those. And you, 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 know, you get that distribution you know, quite nicely centered on the prediction or close to the prediction of the, yeah. of the theory. Uh, regarding the variability around that, uh, have you partitioned that between variation within individuals? Yes. Right, right yeah. So we're actually going through hard a Bayesian approach to estimate uh, all those, uh, well, including all those different sources of, of error and, and where uh, uh, effectively uh, how we can then partition that variation, that variation in terms of differences between individuals, differences between species, differences between branching level, for example. But I will say that in those distributions that I showed you, those are all from, for, for a given species, those are all from one individual. question regarding your last uh, graph where uh, you mentioned that there were other factors that could affect why uh, well, why some of the variability was outside of your predicted value. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain that a little more? Oh, so, so is this the mortality? mortality? Yes. Yeah. Let's okay, so go back to that really quickly. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so but in, in order to explain that, actually, I would like to uh, go back to this slide, OK? And so one thing that, that you can notice um, from the size distribution I highlighted in the other graph as well, once we get to increasingly larger sizes, um, uh, there, there's pretty strong indication that we see increasing deviation from the very simple power function fit. Um, in fact, you can actually go sh through and show that more of a curved linear um, uh, a function is a better fit uh, to these relationships. Um, and so it's not a pure power function because we do see, again, important deviation. But what's interesting is that, look, once we get out to the larger sizes, we're actually getting fewer numbers of larger trees than we would expect. And so then if I flash forward here then to the mortality, okay, once we get out to these larger trees, they actually show a higher mortality rate. Okay? And so that makes sense. There's fewer numbers of individuals out there because they actually have a higher mortality rate. So remember, this mortality rate function is actually predicted from the mortality due to competitive thinning only. Okay? Well, very clearly, there are other sources of mortality within the forest, especially once we get up within the canopy, especially if you're a very big tree or an old tree. Right? There are going to be other things that potentially may kill you, um, such as being hit by lightning or blown down in the wind uh, and, and so on. Um, so what we actually see is departure then from this prediction of all mortality being just due to competition. And so what I actually find very intriguing with this is that if you take this literally, what this says is that deviation from that line is then one way to quantify non-competitively induced sources mortality. Okay? Which presumably here increases well, as soon as you get uh, not only up into the canopy, but once you get to be really big. I had a question about what your theory can say about lianas and climbing plants, uh, which are able to access resources without investing yeah. the same amount of biomass. And maybe can your model be used to sort of explore their role in forest communities? That's a great question. We've, we've always wondered about how lianas fit within this, because they um, basically violate a lot of the, some of the secondary assumptions. Um, and you know, the, the quick answer is I don't know because we don't really have a lot of data um, from lianas, but I think they would be a very good test case uh, for this. Um, and effectively, lianas are, are structural parasites um, uh, you know, going off the biomechanics of somebody else. Um, and so they, they're probably able to, to, to cheat the system so they don't have to obey some of these things. So actually, I think it would be very insightful uh, to look at lianas. Um, but also the question is why aren't Lianas then taking over the world then, if that's the case. And so I, I, the quick answer is I don't know, but I've been re I'm really interested. In a yes. couple of the slides you showed changes in the exponent with time. 
And I'm just wondering what the links to climate change might be. Might those changes be related to climate change? Or? Changes in the exponent with time. Was it this one that you were looking, well, there was, looking there was at? A, there were several. I, one was okay. 76. Oh, sure. Um, yes, in fact, um, I can speak to that because I know this forest very well. So this is the San Emilio Forest. Um, and I actually have um, another paper coming out in Global Change Biology where we actually not only look at this relationship, but we actually ask what has been the main dominant driver of the dynamics, um, uh, mainly having to do with uh, other sources of mortality within the forest. And between 1976 and 1996, that actually corresponds to a string of exceptionally dry years um, within uh, the ACG in particular, within uh, very close to the, um, the weather stations close then to our, our, our forest plot here in San Emilio. And so this forest has actually seen um, between those two surveys a, an exceptional number of, of un, in fact, unprecedented number of extremely low rainfall years. And what we see within the forest is a, um, a, a big turnover in the total number of stems. And all of the mortality of, of the stems are actually occurring in the very smallest size classes. Um, here. And we actually see a functional shift within those size classes going from an evergreen, uh, an, uh, an understory dominated by evergreen species, well, more dominated by evergreen species, I should say, to, to an, an understory then effectively being uh, completely dominated by deciduous um, species. And so a complete functional change. And so there was actually a very big decrease um, in the number of individuals um, having to do with drought. <coughs> And you can see that here. Remember, this is a logarithmic scale. So these are huge changes right here. Um, in terms of if you sum them, those differences, um, you get, um, you get uh, a fairly big change in the total number of individuals within the forest. What's interesting is that we don't see, in terms of mortality or change in the number of individuals, any sort of change across the other size classes. But the mortalities effectively hit um, uh, this, 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 this drought-induced change, what appears to be occurring, at all of the smallest size classes. And, and again, this is also consistent with the functional change that we see um, within those size classes. And so one can begin, at least, um, to, to look at deviations you know, from this as an expectation of potentially what may happen in, in terms of drought. Now, drought would be important because these very small trees have very small uh, rooting volumes. They're more closely, uh, they'll be rooting closer to the surface. So probably they'd be more susceptible um, to, to mortality. Um, and actually, I've, I've quite a bit to say about that. Um, and we say much more about it in our paper coming out in Global Change Biology, where we actually use this as, as, as a way to begin to look at uh, how drought influences the forest. Thank you.